Li Wei and I work at a startup downtown called Button. And today I'm going to talk to you about how we designed our scalable financial data store. So starting with a brief um, agenda, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me before moving on to the data engineering challenge for building a financial data store. And then after that, I will dive into the mistakes we made before getting to the meat of the talk, our solution. And lastly, I'll talk to you a little bit about where we landed. So about me, embarrassing photo. Um, I graduated from Columbia, two degrees, so it's great to be back. And I started my career off in business intelligence, working mostly on getting metrics to service to our business partners. And I kind of gradually transitioned to data and platform engineering. Right now, I'm team lead for a platform team at Button, and I work with a group of super talented engineers building out some of our core platform services. Um, and lastly, fun fact, I love Super Smash Brothers. I play this a lot in my spare time, probably dedicate more time to that than I should. <laughs> so on to the data engineering challenge. As data engineers, I don't know if you have experienced this, but you are more likely than not to be asked to provide a source of truth for downstream customers. And your users tells you that your data needs to be accurate, timely, and easy to use. And this is kind of tough when your users are very varied and they use your data in different ways. So this is particularly a challenge, I would argue, for financial data. At any company, almost everyone is dependent on financial data in one way or another, but they all kind of have different ways to access it and use it. I have a diagram here of, um, in the middle, you have financial data, and outside you have all the users who use that data. So I'm gonna start with the most obvious one. Let me see if this pointer works. So you have the finance team. Obviously, finance team uses financial data to build your users, your clients, and they also use this to report back your, uh, the, the health of the company to your board. And then on the right, you have the sales team, whose performance is actually tied to how much revenue they bring in, so they have a vested interest in accurate measurement of financial performance. And then with marketing, a lot of marketing, a lot of marketers uh, uses dollar metrics to track the success of their marketing campaigns. And then I'm going to shift focus to a different use case, which is for customer support. Customer support wants to see, want to observe the data lineage of your financial data. They tend to look at one or two orders and figure out what happened to the order? Why was the order commissioned this way? Like, why is the order deleted? And lastly, you have engineers and other services who talk to your financial data store through your APIs. Oh, sorry, I forgot about data analytics. Um, data analytics is a very special usage pattern in and of itself. Your data scientists like to slice and dice your data by arbitrary columns, and you can predict ahead of time how they will, what type of insights they need to gather from your data. So taking all of the aggregate groups in your company, um, I've collected a list of five access patterns. They include aggregate performance, we provide users CSV exports with raw financial transactions. Uh, we provide users list endpoints to programmatically fetch those transactions. And you have API endpoints for talking to other services. And lastly, we, pro we publish data downstream for analytics. So quick overview of uh, a very simplified version of what the system looks like. In the beginning, you ingest orders, you process orders, you add new fields, you figure out how much the commission is, and then all of the orders go into your financial data store. And that is the source of truth for publishing to downstream users. So for reporting and analytics, we uh, provide a pub sub that the analytics team can listen into, and they take the data and port it to an analytics data warehouse. For us, we use Redshift, and then for reporting, we have a separate service that also listens into the stream and 
aggregate the data into pure computer metrics. So for the service itself, it provides two additional access points, one being kind of like CRUD APIs for other services, and the other being the ability to bulk export data from the service. So after um, taking stock of all the ways our users want to access the data, we came to the following conclusion. The real challenge uh, with working with financial data is that you kind of have a mix of OLTP and OLAP access patterns. Um, is, everyone, is, like, I, is everyone familiar with the terms? Yeah, okay, cool, then I'll skip the explanation. So the OLTP use case is fairly obvious. We are literally dealing with transactions and every single write to the database translates to dollar exchanging hands. So this means that the service can have no downtime, high availability, and we need to support low latency writes, all characteristics of OLTP. And lastly, accuracy is crucial, and having asset properties from the data store is a nice thing to have. On the OLAP side, most of the use cases I discussed right before are actually OLAP use cases because the users need to access a large number of records. They look at, say, the last month or the last years of data and figure out the total aggregations based on those records. So for the OLAP users, we need to allow easy aggregation, easy performant aggregation, the ability to fetch huge number of historical records in a very, very fast, and lastly, offer the analytics users the ability to slice and dice over any number of any set of fields. So next up, uh, the first time we tackled this problem, we made a few mistakes. So um, a bit of historical context here. I think when you work at a startup, the first time you build out your financial data store is when you first start making sizable amount of money, money that's enough to warrant investing engineering resources to building out this framework. So that is what we did. and. We thought at the time that we only needed to support OLTP use cases, and that was, as you can tell from the previous slide, a uh, wrong assumption. The biggest uh, mistake that we made in our first iteration was that we were overriding transactions with the latest date. This means, in this example here, that users are not able to access the history of events that happen over time. They're only able to see what the state is today. So we have our customer support, Chris, who sees that the order total was $200 two days earlier, and a couple of days later, he sees that it's $2,000. And it's completely unclear for him what happened in that process. It could be a system bug, it could be that the user modified the order, but he because he doesn't have that history, he cannot say for sure. This was also, as you can imagine, problematic for the finance team. Uh, imagine your finance team download your CSV on January 1st and they compile 500. All of these numbers are made up, so take it with a grain of salt. They compile f half a billion dollars in revenue, and then a couple of days later, they re-download the file and they see it went down to 350 million. So this is problematic for them because they can't use the data until it stabilizes. And they also don't have a view into what caused the change. Um, and a separate user pain point that they raised to us outside of immutability is that the experts were taking very, very long to download. Sometimes it takes upwards of two hours, three hours to download the set of data that they're searching for. So we kind of saw a lot of discontent expressed by users of financial data across the company. And we were, because of the discontent, we were given a second chance to rebuild our system for the better. And these are the five data choices that we made. So for the data redesign, we thought about how could we redesign the data to better serve our users. The first principle is kind of obvious. Um, we move from mutable data to immutable data. 
which means that records are only inserted, never updated in place. So why immutable? The previous slides show that this was the biggest pain point faced by users. Uh, users want the ability to track changes over time. And the last one is kind of obvious, like financial data should never be mutable. It's something that accountants have been using for centuries in financial bookkeeping. They never cross out an entry and just write whatever they want. They always only add to their bookkeeping. So with immutability comes a couple benefits. You get the ability to audit what happens. Um, and the other benefit is you can reproduce the latest date of an order at any point in time, not just the latest date. And the last benefit is you can, by having this data lineage, you're able to correct for anything that you did wrong in the next accounting period by simply inserting a correction record. So this is how we restructure data, again simplified. Suppose a user books a hotel and they extend it to 10 nights. Previously, they will see only one record with the latest total, 2,000, but now instead they see two separate events, one for the creation event and second for the adjustment event. And the totals reflect the change in the order total that results from the event. And lastly, um, you have a brief message explaining what happened. So, Having this data explains what the customer support departments observed earlier. They can now say with certainty that having the order total be updated from 200 to 2,000 was not a fluke, but actually a user event. Moving on to the second design choice that we did was to use Delta for easy aggregation. Um, Delta means that instead of showing the latest amount, you show the change in amount that results from the event. So as you saw in a previous example, every event maps to an amount that's the change and not the latest. And the benefit of using Delta is you can easily aggregate them through a simple linear function to get the total. And this is important for a lot of use cases. For our data team, because we reformatted the data, they no longer need to, uh, both on the right side is the previous rush of query for fetching total commission and total order, and on the left side is the new query after we made the data update. So you can see that before, uh, users need to figure out through a kind of like a window rush of function what the latest event is for every single order as partitioned by order ID and sorted by event time. And then they take the top records from that and then they can get the total order amount. With the new design, by moving from latest to using deltas, the user can just run a simple sum aggregation over all the records. This also extends to uh, our marketing and finance folks. A lot of people in your organization are not engineers and they don't have the tech savvy to write an Excel VBA script that can just figure out what the latest amount is and pull it out. With deltas, they can simply just add a sum Excel function and it will aggregate it as they expected. So diving a little bit more into the choice of delta, versus latest state and the impact on the data pipeline architecture itself. With Delta, um, as mentioned, you get easy aggregation. You also kind of have a source of truth for computing that Delta. A lot of your downstream users will probably need to compute Delta themselves if you don't compute it upstream. So here you have a single service responsible for that calculation. Deltas are also kind of atomic in a sense that every event is a self-contained description of the change. This means that if you get events out of order, you can apply them independently of each other and your end state will be eventually consistent, which is really nice, which is really nice to have if your pipeline cannot guarantee uh, ordering. So with latest state, there is one benefit you get greater tolerance for missing events because later events will override the previous date. So if you were to miss one event and you can be guaranteed you will receive a later event, the missing event is not a big deal. We use 
our system uses SQS for passing messages between services, and Amazon only recently wrote out FIFO, which, uh, which gave you ordering. So for us, the ability to have changes that can be applied independently of each other without ordering and still have eventual consistency was a powerful principle to have, was a powerful attribute to have. So moving on to the third data design choice, um, we decided that our previous schema had a too normalized design and that was the biggest contributing factor to why the CSVs were taking so long to run. So with the new design, we went with fewer tables, but with a lot of dimensions. So why denormalize? Going back to the previous challenge of supporting both OLAP and OLTP use cases, uh, denormalized is usually the schema for the OLAP use case. And you can see that we actually had more OLAP use cases than we have OLTP use cases. So this is kind of a summary of what we said previously. OLAP includes marketing, finance, data, and partners, whereas the OLTP use cases include processing transactions and supporting customer support. So we kind of went with a hybrid approach here by picking a traditional OLTP, like relational database, we picked Postgres, but we store the data in a very denormalized format. And this is not very much the end state, but it gave us the performance, that, the performance gains that we wanted. Um, on the left, you can kind of see the previous financial data store schema. There are almost 20 tables, all with foreign keys pointing to each other, and a single read-through for a single transaction records meant a lot of querying, and that meant a long time to fetch a single record. And on the right, we have the new denormalized data schema, where there are only four tables, and just by denormalizing the data, we were able to improve CXP export speeds by eight times. So finance was very happy with the increase. Uh, moving on to the fourth one, we decided to keep separate bookkeeping for billing versus for the event log. And this means that, and the reason we decided to do that is that we talked to uh, our counterparts in sales and we realized that the part that's most likely to change in the future is our billing model. We may not always bill on a per order basis. We may choose to introduce new pricing models that are subscription based or SaaS models. And so having separate records for billing allows us to extend to incorporate those in the future. So here you see that you may have events that don't map one to one to transactions. And, that's, and transactions are stored in an um, entirely separate table or database. As mentioned, this allows you to get stable tracking of which events fit into each invoice. You can also, this also allows for later adjustments. For example, if you were missing event, you can still adjust for it by adding a billing record into your invoice. And lastly, it allows for future extensions in our billing logic. So at the top, uh, we have the immutable event lock previously introduced, and at the bottom, we have a separate record for financial transactions. And when we first introduced the service, financial transactions are one too many for event logs. And this data is only, is only used by our billing team, whereas the top data has more users, including marketing, sales, customer support. Um, and then we are on to the last data design choice, which is self-heal. For every type of ETL pipeline, you can't guarantee everything will be accurate from the get-go, but you can design for it to be easily recoverable and to self-heal. So self-heal for us means programmatic detection and adjustments for errors. We found that the previous data principles, data design choices we made really helped with programmatic detection, 
because we have immutable data, we can track the data lineage and we can figure out if something goes wrong, we can just append a new event. And so does having separate records for billing. As mentioned, having separate records for billing means you have an immutable, completely separate record. So if billing, for whatever reason, doesn't match to your events, you can always adjust for it because you can compare them side by side and add in a later adjustment. And lastly, uh, something we discovered later is it's very important to limit points of failure because it is extremely expensive to build in new adjustment paths. So if the fewer points of failure you have, the fewer paths or ingestion point into adjusting your data you need to support. So a couple of examples of how we were able to do this. Um, when an order was processed late, it was never reported for whatever reason and it didn't make it into its proper billing cycle, we automatically detect that and add it to the next billing cycle. And we also automatically check our billing records against the event records and make adjustments if they don't align for whatever reasons. Um, what we've learned. And these are like a couple learnings specific to financial data. We found stable ID and ordering to be key. So one thing that really helped us out was we set the sequence, we set a sequence number and a unique order ID extremely, uh, like at the entry point for order ingestion. And we carry those two fields all the way downstream. This means that our, every step in the processing pipeline, we can always map um, event back to the point of origin, which is very helpful for debugging. And some quirks of financial data we discovered, you never want to use floats. If you see a rounding error, it's most likely because of floats stuck in there somewhere. Uh, we also found that in, for like financial data, there are a lot of dates, and getting clear definition for those dates from the get-go is really important. Uh, we found that our external users tend to use those states to map events into their system, so any change to those states will break something in their system. And lastly, we discovered that data double entry, um, which is to have one record for, say, when we pay a partner and separate record for when, well, I guess, two records for every transaction really didn't matter. It mattered more when, um, you're using paper trails and having the balancing allows you to check one side against the other. Uh, so changing the data schema was part of kind of a bigger rebuild process where we actually, we used the, the new financial data store to kick off revamping the entire order processing pipeline. Uh, this was our old processing pipeline where we had Money train, that's what we call the financial data store, being responsible for almost like seven different types of use cases. And we found the database to be extremely slow, users were complaining, it was not performing as anticipated. So we moved all of the data from the old data store into the new data store and made the old data store only responsible for commission logic. And this was kind of a, a fairly like involved migration so, and there were a couple of things that we learned from that, which is when you do this type of migration, I won't get into the details, you want to compare the full data set instead of just comparing new events. We had a script that did apple to apple comparison for incoming orders, but that was not sufficient for capturing all the errors that, as, that came through as part of the migration process. Uh, a second thing to know is that immutability has its benefits, but it does come with the downside of a hit to your performance. So you may very likely need to add in pre-computation for collapsing your event logs as after introducing immutability. And lastly, this is specific to the analytics use case. Backfilling even a single event can be painful because for analytics use, you don't anticipate data to be available going forward only, you anticipate data to be always available, which makes backfill necessary. So if you can avoid it, try to avoid it and just have the full set of fields from the get-go. And lastly, if uh, things don't work out, have a rollback strategy. So where did we improve? CSV was much faster. 
um, our CX team gets data lineage into how the order was processed. Aggregation is simpler, not just for data scientists, for users of Excel, but also for our jobs. We didn't need to write like very complicated jobs to perform aggregation. And lastly, we got through immutably, we were able to enable programmatic detection and correction. So some future extensions plan is to add additional dimensions. We're collecting new newer attributes and self de like self-derived attributes for users. So we'll likely append that to your financial data. Um, for sales team, they're exper experimenting with different pricing models. And that's something we'll like, likely need to support in the future, both the experimentation part and also the different pricing model part. Uh, and the last one is, when we do hit a performance bottleneck, we haven't seen that yet, it might be the time to move to a better storage engine than Postgres. Um, and that is my talk. Questions? Uh, so I have a question, actually. So um, uh, in one of the later slides, I noticed that you have this order close date, but is there, is there ever any data in which you don't like uh, you don't have some sort of a close date. Like I'm wondering if you have a um, uh, some kind of an event that comes in, let's say for the month of January, but it comes in, you know, several months later. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you deal with, let's say, an aggregation query? You're trying to figure out what's happening in January, but you don't know what the sort of upper bound on the query is supposed to be. Uh, that's why we ask the user to use a different day. We have one day that's never changing, and that's the day we ingest an order into our system. So if we want a user to, like, can say for a matter of fact that after this point in time, you will not see data change, we ask them to use that. Um, and as for close date, we use close date to represent when an order was actually built to the partner, and that's, also not something that's modifiable. So say that you bill, and later order comes through and it was not built until January, that close date will always be in January and the order will never be counted for towards previous billing cycle. I guess my answer would really be that every record for date is kind of a source of truth for when, what the date represents. And depending on different use cases, we advise users to different, use different dates for filtering. And we do have to support um, indexing on all of the dates mentioned because like our users do query on almost, query and filter on almost every one of them. And yeah, that definitely adds a database load for writes. But so far, it has not became a bottleneck.